2017 Bugatti Chiron. If there's any doubt about the Bugatti Chiron's raison d'etre, it's written right on the steering wheel, on a large blue button emblazoned with one word, engine. Sure, we could wax poetic about the marriage of modern technology to the ancient human craving to express vanity and wealth. Or about how the 1,500 horsepower Chiron is metaphorically the 700 room Chateau de Versailles with tailpipes, how the $3 million price means it is no crazier than hiring an artist to spend four years painting God and Adam and angels and saints on your chapel ceiling. In other words, we could go on and on about how it is an exuberant, untethered overstatement in the service of generating delirious stupefaction, both in the nobles who luxuriate in it and the peasants who revel in its reflected glory. All ate up with motor. But the new 261 mile per hour bug is really just about being all ate up with motor. It's about old-fashioned combustion in 16 furnaces amidships that are blown into a furious conflagration by quad-turbo fans. Push that engine button and the 8.0-liter W16 lights, not with the ear-bending bark of an Italian supercar, Bugatti figures it is above those kinds of bad boy theatrics, but with the manly burble of a lazy 650 revolution per minute idle. To paraphrase Theodore Roosevelt, speak softly and carry a suitcase nuke. To be brutally cynical, for that's the last refuge of plebeians who cannot now and never will be able to afford a Chiron, this car is a do-over. It's a reboot of a last decade idea for reviving a slumbering auto boutique with a moonshot engineering project intended to create shock and awe. The 1001 horsepower Veyron 16.4 was the busted sound barrier, the Everest summit, the 4 minute mile. It was the car that went 1 mile per hour faster than the Peugeot P88, the fastest race car on the Mulsanne straight, just because. The benchmarks have all been bested, the hyperbole all belabored. It seems pointless to raise the bar again with another mid-engined two-seat coupe, like enrolling Superman in a CrossFit class in the hopes of widening the gap over those speeding bullets. Viewed more charitably, the concept was perhaps not fully tapped. The Veyron may have improved greatly during its 10-year, 450-car slow drip of a production run, but its handling never rose above that of a blindingly fast Lexus. Unlike Lexus, it was loud inside, and not a good kind of loud but a loud born of thrumming tires and ticking injectors and wearing accessories and those great sucking bazookas behind your head. And its slightly corpulent styling was perhaps a shade too Milan Rouge for some and not enough Eve Montand with a cocked cigarette and a piercing squint. It was an awesome thing, the Veyron, but not above a sequel. Shock and awe is highly perishable and engineers always need new challenges. Over some squid nibbles and other Portuguese delicacies at a Lisbon bistro near the Tagus River, I am assured that the Chiron was indeed a worthy challenge. At first, explained chassis development head Jacan Schwal, the thinking was just to restyle the Veyron and crank up the boost. But everybody soon realized that going from 1200 horsepower in the hottest Veyrons, the Super Sport and the Grand Sport Vitesse, to a still drivable 1500 in the Chiron required more than just a bigger blow. Eventually, nearly every single part number changed in the engine. And in the 7-speed transmission. And in the two clutches. And the wheels, tires, brakes, and self-adjusting suspension. And the body, aerodynamic devices, and interior. Even the hand-painted, solid silver Bugatti grille badge got a facelift. The art of an art object. Perhaps Louis Chiron's biggest achievement was being the oldest driver, 55, ever to compete in a Grand Prix. The big C that defines the Chiron's side profile, as well as the spinal ridge and the extravagant sweep of LED accent lighting that cleaves the cockpit, is either a tribute to his name, to the rather expansive way Eat or Bugatti render the E in his personal signature, or to the Type 57 SC Atlantic. The company leaves it up to you to decide, but the Chiron is an altogether more purposeful shape, the horseshoe grill pushed forward into the wind to initiate a sleeker and somewhat tenser profile. The 8 LED headlights, which illuminate sequentially inward on startup, and the 82 LED tail light blade are riveting elements, the latter housed in a thin scythe milled from a 441-pound block of aluminum. As in the Veyron. 
The cockpit exudes artful minimalism, but the Chiron takes it even further. The center stack looks like the four fingers of a metal sea anemone, the tips of which are digital readouts that can tell you everything from the oil temperature to the max speed achieved and the horsepower tapped on the current trip. Almost certainly the last of its kind as supercars give way to super hybrids and super electrics, the Chiron's main selling point against other objects are from the likes of Pagani or Koenigsegg is that it hails from the Volkswagen Group, which built an average of 28,176 cars every day of last year. So this is art that is likely to start in 20 degree weather. Just imagine Michelangelo or, indeed, Etor Bugatti having 3D computer modeling, wind tunnels, and hundreds of talented artisans at his disposal. Would the result have been so different? Two thousand seventeen Acura NSX. If a 3,868-pound, all-wheel-drive hybrid strikes you as a curious sequel to the original Bantamweight NSX, you're not alone. As vehicle performance lead engineer Jason Widmer tells it, the initial prospect of a gas-electric NSX caused as much hand-wringing within Honda's hallways as raised eyebrows outside them. In the early days of the new car, NSX mules consistently laid down faster laps without the battery electric assist system that was supposed to make the thing quicker. That was more than five years ago, and the NSX's hybrid electric system is now a fully developed piece of go faster kit. The car rolling out of Marysville, Ohio, seamlessly combines two turbochargers, three electric motors, four driven wheels, six cylinders, and nine forward gears to produce bona fide supercar performance. That won't make it any less controversial, there are an infinite number of ideas as to what a resurrected NSX should have been. The concept that one out is a rolling test bed for the future of performance technology. You will not find a car in this category in 10 years that won't have electrification. I'm confident on that, Widmer says. So are we. The NSX isn't the first of its kind to mesh electrons and hydrocarbons in the pursuit of speed, but give Acura credit for so rapidly democratizing the technology. Even with a starting price of $157,800, the NSX is hard evidence of the kind of trickle-down economics that actually works. Sacrificing a fraction of the performance and the pure electric driving capability of the 2015 Porsche 918 Spider netted Acura a $700,000 price cut for its mid-engined hero. Widmer may have been talking about McLarens, Lamborghinis, and Ferraris when he made his 10-year prediction, but the electrification of performance won't stop at supercars. Defying physics, the electrons are poised to flow into iconic performance cars where there's even more resistance. Hybridized 911s and BMW Mies are an eventuality, not just a possibility. This NSX is a preview of things to come. Acura could highlight the NSX's electric hardware if it would mimic Tesla's strategy of activating full reg and braking when the driver lifts off the throttle, either in the less sporty driving modes or with a stand-alone, selectable option. One pedal driving becomes another connection to the machine, allowing the driver to be an active participant in managing the battery charge and timing accelerator application with greater intention. If we were Acura, we'd consider it. We apparently weren't too considerate with the right pedal, because we averaged 17 miles per gallon in our time with the NSX, well off the NSX's 21 mile per gallon EPA combined rating. While the 21 mile per gallon city rating is unmatched by the competition, the 22 mile per gallon highway rating is below that of the 570S and the 911 Turbo S. The irony of the NSX is that it's far more impressive for its chassis than for the complex hybrid system that serves as its reason for being. Maybe that's because the handling really is that good. Or maybe it's because Acura is still searching for the perfect daily use driving mode, somewhere between Sport Plus and Sport.
You can be sure that Acura is in a race to perfect its hybrid system with multiple competitors currently prepping similar arrangements. Give it a few more years of development. But let's hope Acura keeps the chassis the way it is.